Hi, my name is Hisham. I'd like to give a short talk on an interesting usage of DVF's quantum annealing to solve traffic optimization problem. I worked on this problem during my undergrad with my friend Mohammed bin Jawed at the National University of Sciences and Technology. We recently published the resulting paper in the general quantum information processing. As you may already know, DWF's annealer is not a universal quantum computer. It can only solve combinatorial optimization problems, so we need to formulate our problem in a specific form known as Kubo. The problem is encoded in the matrix Q, which is an n by n matrix of real numbers. n is the number of binary variables in the problem. The goal of Kubo is to minimize the objective function by assigning binary values to the variable x. I will explain how we formulated our problem in this format. I'll provide a resource in the end that explains Kubo in a greater detail. This figure shows a quick overview of the inner working of DWAVE's annealer. After we have formulated a Kubo problem instance, it is converted to an Ising type Hamiltonian, which is then mapped onto the qubit in DWAVE's annealer using minor embedding and then evolved while maintaining the ground state. The end result shows the configuration of variables that would approximately minimize the Hamiltonian and as a result our objective function. In this presentation, I will focus mainly on how we got the Kubo problem as that is the bulk of the work we were focused on. Now let's look at the work that we did. The problem at hand is how would one control traffic signals such that maximum traffic flow is achieved in minimum time. We chose to define maximum traffic flow by considering the time wasted by vehicles waiting behind red signals and attempted to minimize this metric. Now we come to the representation of our problem. We represent the map on which vehicles move as an n by m grid. The arrows represent the direction of traffic flow in each lane. To be able to represent our cost function mathematically, let's assign labels to each intersection on the map. We index intersections over i. The traffic at each intersection is mediated by a traffic signal. Now let's take a look at the possible ways in which traffic can flow at an intersection depending on how signals are activated. Let's call these modes and there are total 6 of them. I assume a left hand drive but you can just as easily reverse them to obtain the mode for the right hand drive. This animation shows mode number 1 being active on an intersection. And this animation shows mode number 2 being active on this intersection. Every Kubo problem needs a binary variable, so we define our binary variable to be xij. xij is 1 only if mode j is active on intersection i. j runs from 1 to 6 as there are 6 modes, and in every other case, xij is 0. Let's look at an example. At an intersection number where i is equal to 1, if mode j equals 2 is active, only x12 is equal to 1 and rest of the x's are 0. Here's another example. At an intersection where i is equal to 3, if mode j equals 2 is active, then only x35 is 1 and rest of the x's are 0. But now, how will we know which mode should be active, meaning which x should be 1 and which should be 0? For that, we first consider the number of cars that will be able to move if a certain mode is active. We denote this number of cars by Cij, which is the number of cars at intersection i that can move if mode j is active. Uh, here's an example. If C1 if we look at C11, uh, this means that at intersection i is equal to 1, if we activate mode 1, how many cars can be able to move uh, across this intersection? So if you look at this figure, there are these three cars on the down right lane and then there are these three cars at the 
top lane and these and this total of six cards will be able to move if we activate mode one uh, now if you activate mode two these five cards will be able to move across the intersection these four cards can move if we activate the mode three at this intersection if we activate this mode mode number four total of five cards can move the two yellow cards on this side and the three yellow cards on the right side similarly for mode five these four cards on the left side will be able to move and if we activate mode number six on this intersection the five cards on the right side of the road will be able to move across this intersection but there is a slight subtlety in real life we don't know for sure how many cars will go straight or turn at each intersection but since we need this information to formulate our problem let's assume we can estimate a reasonable probability that a given car will go straight f denotes the fraction of cars that will go straight and using this we can easily calculate the cij values for each intersection If we express what I just said into a Kubo form, we would have something like this. This is an expression for a single intersection. The Cij are being multiplied with the respective Xij. And if we put in the value of these Cij from the previous slide, such that C11 is 6, C12 is 5, and so on, we get this expression. Now, once again the goal is to minimize this expression so if we choose x11 to be 1 we get negative 6 and if we choose let's say x13 to be 1 we get negative 3 so uh, if you look at this expression the minimum value that we can get is if we choose x11 to be 1 uh, in this case we will get negative 6 so that's why we will choose x11 to be equal to 1 uh, incidentally, we can only choose one value, one of these x's can be 1 and the rest have to be equal to 0. Uh, we will uh, discuss more about that in a later slide. If this is written in a compressed form for intersection i equals 1, we have this. Generally, there is also going to be a sum over all intersections i. So we call this whole term the local optimization term. Now we also want the modes at different linked intersections to complement each other's. Intersections should not be completely independent of each other. Ideally, a vehicle should be able to move through a green corridor, a succession of green signals to save time. Here are some examples of complementary modes. This is a complementary mode because the cars that passes through the uh, intersection in the middle and if they go to the intersection at the top they will be able to continue moving because the mode that is on the intersection on the above intersection complements the mode that is in the middle intersection this is another example in which the intersection in the middle and the topmost intersection have complementary modes this is an example where the two modes do not complement each other because a car that has passed through the middle intersection have to wait to pass through the intersection at the top. Now let's look at some full examples of signal coordination. If we have mode 1, uh, the uptown mode active in the middle intersection, the complementary modes on the adjacent intersections are shown. Uh, there are four of them in total. Let's look at them one by one. Uh, so here we have uh, one of these modes. Here is another one of these complementary modes. This is another complementary mode because the cars that pass that have passed through the middle intersection can continue their journey through the intersect through the other connected intersections here is an other uh, example of the complementary modes on the connected intersection uh, note that for the for mode 1 uh, 
the four examples that we looked are the only four possible cases of complementary modes if we have mode one active on the middle intersection. This table lists all the complementary modes on adjacent intersections A dash, B dash, C dash, and D dash for every intersection I. It's just a concise general summary of what I just told before. We just look we have been just looking on the first row of this column for the last few slides. But you can see that uh, I've here I've listed the complementary modes for all the modes. For mode two, you can look at the second row and for mode 5, you can look at the second last row and so on. Using this information, we can construct an additional term in the objective function whose goal is to synchronize or coordinate adjacent intersections. This is a simplified version of that term. It gives an incentive, a negative cost for adjacent intersections to have complementary modes. However, it needs a few more additions. We are a bit biased towards the complementary modes which allow both straight going and turning traffic. We make this distinction because these modes clear out a large number of vehicles. To represent this in the equation, we add constants lambda 3 and lambda 3 dash. Lambda 3 dash is greater than lambda 3 to represent this bias. Uh, but we don't want traffic signals to coordinate instantaneously as it takes time for a vehicle to move from one intersection to the next. As you can see here, uh, they should synchronize only when a vehicle is close to the next intersection. To take care of this, we add some more variables to our cost function. We call them tau i i dash. They're constructed in such a way that they are zero if a vehicle has not had enough time to move to the next intersection. It turns one only if a vehicle if enough time has elapsed such that a vehicle has reached the next intersection. This leads to green corridors, a succession of green signals. Here we have full synchronization term with lambda 3 and lambda 3 dash as well as tau i i dash. Finally, on to the last term in the objective function. This is the constraint term that ensures only one mode is selected to active on each signal. For any other solution, it imposes a large positive penalty denoted by lambda 4. To obtain the full objective function, we add all of the three terms, the uh, local optimization term, the synchronization term, and the uh, penalty term that we uh, saw in the last slide. We have the lambda 1 and lambda 2 terms to fine tune how much we value local optimization, the first term, relative to coordinating adjacent signals, the second term. Different traffic scenarios could call for different value of these. This is the workflow of our programmed simulation. Initial information about the time, map, and vehicles is fed into the algorithm, which then constructs the cost function, the Q matrix. This is then solved using D Wave, uh, using the Leap Hybrid Solver. And the result is interpreted in term of which mode to active at each intersection. The vehicles then move accordingly inside our simulation, which runs inside our classical PC. After a fixed amount of time, say 5 seconds, the data is fed into the algorithm again and the whole process repeats. Finally, here are the results showing the total number of hours wasted by all vehicles within 5 minutes of simulation time. Uh, there were a total of 4320 vehicles in each simulation. We tested this problem both using a classical solver, uh, Cubisol, and the Leap hybrid solver using D-Wave's annealer. 
We also tried out the problem with and without syncing terms. As you can see, the solution quality on the Leap Hybrid and Classical solvers were roughly equal and synchronizing signals had a minor but a noticeable benefit in terms of time saved. As expected, having fixed signal cycle, which is independent of timing, of timing and traffic, uh, yielded the worst results. For more information on this problem, you can find our paper on this DOI link. You can also refer to the below link for information about Kubo formalism. I personally found it very helpful. For questions and suggestions, feel free to reach me at hashamqc at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your time.